Buenas tardes. Vamos a dar comienzo con el protocolo de inauguración de este evento, la séptima reunión anual de la Asociación de Nefrólogos de México, Asociación Civil, en esta hermosa y próspera ciudad de Aguascalientes. Reunión cuyo mensaje médico clínico está relacionado a la enfermedad renal crónica en el adulto mayor. Quiero presentarles al personal distinguido que nos acompaña en el presidium de este evento. En primer lugar, al doctor Antonio Muñoz Acutiño, quien es el presidente de la Asociación Nacional de Nefrólogos de México. Al doctor Guillermo García García, quien actualmente es el presidente de las Federaciones Internacionales de Fundaciones Renales. Al doctor Lawrence Agodoa, quien es el coordinador del programa de salud renal en grupos minoritarios de los Institutos Nacionales de Salud en los Estados Unidos. Al doctor Marcelo Tonelli, médico nefrólogo, quien es ahora el coordinador del Comité de Investigación y de Prevención de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología. Y al doctor Rafael Rojas Acevedo, médico cirujano de trasplantes que trabaja en el Hospital Miguel Hidalgo de esta ciudad de Aguascalientes, quien acude en representación del Secretario de Salud, el doctor Francisco Esparza Parada. Invito pues al doctor Rafael Reyes Acevedo a que nos acompañe para inaugurar este evento. Muchas gracias. Eh, buenos días, distinguidos miembros del presidium y distinguida audiencia. El doctor Francisco Esparza Parada, secretario de Salud del Estado de Aguascalientes, eh, lamenta no estar en posibilidad de, de asistir, de asistir el día de hoy, acompañarnos en esta ceremonia de inauguración de la séptima reunión anual de la Asociación Nacional de Nefrólogos de México. Debo, debo decirles sentidamente que para mí es un honor asistir en, en representación de él y también es un gusto, es un gusto asistir a esta reunión. Yo no soy nefrólogo, sin embargo, me unen muy diversos lazos de amistad con muchos de ustedes, cosa que me alegra muchísimo. También eh, quisiera compartirles que he visto de cerca las reuniones científicas que organiza la Asociación Nacional de Nefrólogos de México, Asociación Civil. Me ha dado la impresión, desde que, desde que vi por primera vez esta reunión, de que ustedes deciden hacer un alto y dar lugar a la reflexión. ¿Cuánta falta nos hace reflexionar? Y ustedes lo hacen. Lo hacen y yo los felicito y lo reconozco por ello. Los sistemas de salud están agobiados, rebasados, por el grave impacto de la enfermedad, de la enfermedad renal crónica. Sus alcances son todavía inciertos, quizás no imaginables aún. Dentro de ello, ustedes han optado por abordar el complejísimo mundo de la enfermedad renal crónica en la tercera edad. Ya se vislumbran con las conferencias que hemos escuchado, con lo que vemos en el programa, las gravísimas implicaciones tanto científicas como económicas, bioéticas y morales a las que nos ha tocado enfrentarnos quienes tenemos de alguna manera participación en el cuidado del paciente con enfermedad renal crónica. Esta reunión será con toda certeza de gran utilidad para nuestra formación y nuestro ejercicio médico. Les reitero el saludo de nuestro Secretario de Salud, el doctor Francisco Esparza Parada. Les doy la bienvenida a Aguascalientes y les agradezco sentidamente su presencia. Muchas gracias.
Bueno, de acuerdo a la, a la instrucción eh, del doctor Pablo Vega, del doctor Guillermo, les agradezco que me den el, el honor de, de inaugurar esta, esta reunión. Les pido que se pongan de pie, por favor. Siendo, siendo las 12.20 horas del día 6 de marzo de 2014, eh, damos por iniciado los trabajos de esta séptima reunión de la Asociación Nacional de Nefrólogos de México. Muchas gracias. Buen día. Muchas gracias, Rafael. Muchas gracias. Invitamos a presidio, por favor, de tomar sus asientos acá adelante, porque vamos a continuar con los trabajos del segundo simposio de la enfermedad renal crónica en la Bien, vamos a, a continuar con estas actividades académicas iniciadas hoy por la mañana y después de este acto protocolario inaugural voy a, a invitarles a que participen muy activamente a este segundo simposio de enfermedad renal crónica en la tercera edad y que pues me toca el privilegio de coordinarla y quiero eh, decirles que en este trabajo participan eh, el doctor Lawrence Agoa de los Estados Unidos y va a participar en hablar sobre la estimación de la tasa de filtración glomerular en el adulto mayor y posteriormente dentro de este mismo trabajo simposio eh, hablaremos sobre la prevalencia de la enfermedad renal crónica en el adulto mayor eh, en países desarrollados y vamos a contar con la participación de la doctora eh, Nis Panau de Canadá. Así que invitamos a, al doctor Agoboa que haga uso de este micrófono para iniciar su participación. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Guillermo Garcia for inviting me here and also to acknowledge My presence here was uh, sponsored by the International Society of Nephrology. So I will give uh, our usual uh, ISN commercial before I begin my talk. So the International Society of Nephrology advanced, is responsible for advancing nephrology around the world. And its, its mission is to advance the diagnosis treatment and prevention of kidney diseases in the developing and developed world, to raise aware public awareness, to connect professionals, support research, provide nephrology education and training worldwide, and reduce the frequency and impact of kidney diseases and the associated conditions. The Our global outreach program, it's actually being changed now to ISN program, has, has research and prevention up to about eight funded projects per year, funded tailor-made intervention and screening programs as well as research projects throughout the world, particularly in developing countries. The continuing medical education meetings, it supports up to about 50 CMEs per year, essential teaching to doctors and health practitioners in the emerging world. It's uh, educational ambassador visits, up to 10 visits funded per year, 
providing hands-on training in specific nephrology areas to institutions in underserved countries. So the program's annual application deadlines are listed here. The same deadline every year. And various membership categories possible to accommodate people in emerging countries. Visit the website for more information for membership. The benefits include exclusive eligibility for ISM capacity building programs, subscription to Kidney International and Nature Reviews of Nephrology, reduced registration fees for all ISM events, unrestricted access to ISM Nephrology Gateway, exclusive access to ISM Membership Directory, and subs subscription to ISM News, and email notification, voting rights, opportunity to actively contribute to ISM's humanitarian outreach. These are some of the publications of ISM. And as you all know, the World Kidney Day, uh, the ISM plays a very important role in this. It's coming pretty soon. I think it's a week from now, so, um, 13th of uh, March. If you need more information, this is the website. Now for my talk. So my uh, talk is to discuss with you uh, the, how to estimate renal function in the older population, and this is the outline I will try to follow. Um, we'll try to look at the kidney disease burden, and we heard a lot from Dr. Tonelli this morning about the aging world population, and I'll talk briefly about conventional biomarkers for renal function, the equations that have been um, established for estimating glomerular filtration rate, and then we'll touch finally on estimating renal function in the older, older population. So you've seen this, this, this uh, diagram has been around for over a decade, where we took uh, at the data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey of the United States to estimate the number of people with chronic kidney disease in the United States. Actually, what this point, this diagram was supposed to point out is that most of the people that we see as nephrologists have end-stage kidney disease, and they are just the tip of the, tip of the iceberg. So we see people here in our units, dialysis and transplantation, but on the bottom, we're not coming up to the top, so this, this is like iceberg, most of it is merged in the water, and so we have various levels of kidney function. That's, so they classify this to five stages, one, two, three, four, five, with uh, severity going up to the top. Now, um, Someone else uh, decided to diagram this to illustrate the number of people in each, each uh, stage. So in the United States at that time was estimated that six million people were in stage one and stage two about five million people. But most of the people with chronic kidney disease are in this stage, stage three, about eight million people and four and five has only very, very few people. So the question that you obviously will ask is, what happened to these people? How come they are not up here? Answer is, most of them have died, and probably as a result of the kidney disease or something else before they reach end stage. So um, some other investigators looked at the data and thought, well, there's a lot more going on than just these three uh, five classes of, uh, or stages of uh, 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 chronic kidney disease, and in that, some people have proteinuria uh, of various degrees, and that that should be figured in, in the classification. So this new, more complex um, scheme was devised, and over here, it's supposed to illustrate whether, how frequently these individuals should be seen. So. For example, individuals who have stage one, GFR greater than 90, who have very minimal proteinuria, nephrologists don't need to worry about them except for maybe once a year. 
And um, if they have moderately increased proteinuria, then maybe still about once a year, but if they have severe proteinuria with stage one, they should be seen at least twice a year. Now, if they have uh, mildly decreased renal function, GFR 60 to 89, and minimal proteinuria again, just once a year. Now, let's step over here, stage 3A, decided so many people in this stage that they broke it down to stage 3A, 45 to 59 GFR, and 3B is 30 to 44 GFR. Now, if they have mild proteinuria, 3A, they only need to be seen once a year. But if they have moderately increased proteinuria, they should be seen twice a year. And severely, uh, severe proteinuria, they should be seen at least three times a year. And 3B, you start seeing them twice a year and um, with advancing proteinuria three times a year. Now, if we come to, of course, kidney failure with GFR less than uh, 15, at any level of proteinuria, they, they need to be seen at least four times a year. So this is sort of a guide uh, that Kidney Foundation, National Kidney Foundation of the U.S. has proposed. Uh, this is now almost 10 years. Okay, so looking at that, um, uh, and, and here's data again, and the most recent uh, information we have in the U.S. IDS, 2000, annual data report 2013, looking at the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the United States. And I'm not going to um, worry about these here, but let's focus on the top here. So for the 19, 1988 to 1994 cohorts, you look at individuals in the 20 to 39 year age group, only about 5.1% of them have chronic kidney disease, but 60 plus in the older people, up to 32% of these individuals have chronic kidney disease in that age group, age group above 60. So um, to the period 20 to, um, to 2005 to 2010, um, in the 20 to 39 year age group, it increased from 5.1 to 5.7. And 40 to 59, it increased from 8.4% to 9.1%. And in the older individuals, age group um, increased from 32% to 35%. These are just a di a, a different ways of estimating the presence of chronic kidney disease. But um, the point is, the older you get, the greater the proportion of chronic kidney disease in the population. And over time, it seems to be increasing. Okay, so the global estimates, again, Dr. Tonelli did a very uh, good job this morning in, in bringing this uh, to us. Uh, so the summary here is worldwide, there are approximately 600 million persons aged 60 years and above. So we're defining, according to WHO, older people are defined as 60 years and above. So if you're younger than 60, with most of you in this room are, and you don't need to worry about the discussion today, but you will eventually get there. So this total will double by 2025 and will reach virtually 2 billion people age 60 and over by 2050. And at that time, there will be more people age 60 and over than children under the age of 15 worldwide. So the world is getting old. Generally, as uh, again we heard this morning, women live longer than men, and women represent the majority of caregivers. So now turning to um, the kidney, uh, the very good review, the most recent review that I've seen in the literature, is, it's not published yet, this is in, uh, published, I heard of print, and uh, reviewing the uh, aging of the kidney, and uh, in summary, the, the main functional changes of the aging kidney are seen here. In the glomerulus, usually there's decreased GFR. The tubular function, we've got impaired sodium balance, we impaired fluid balance, 
potassium retention increases, the capacity of the kidneys to dilute urine decreases, and the capacity of the kidneys to lower urine pH with response to the um, systemic acid base is also decreased. For vascular, the, um, the effective renal plasma flow is usually down. Capacity to lower urine pH is also down. Filtration fraction increases, and postglomerular renal vascular resistance increases, and there's also impaired vasodilatory response. Endocrine-wise, the plasma ren renal, um, renal activi renin activity and aldosterone secretion go down. The EPO actually, in the, it goes up in the elderly people, but their response to EPO decreases. And vitamin D activation also decreases in these people, in older people. So as we age, these are some of the various changes that both uh, microscopic and microscopic changes that uh, we expect to see in the kidneys for macroscopic changes. Um, we see kidney weight is usually down. Usually there's some calcification in the kidneys and the, um, the uh, renal mass uh, decreases and usually they usually have renal cysts um, in the kidney as the kidney ages. And these are also various uh, um, changes that uh, some of which I've already mentioned about. And the risk factors for the kidney aging include the genetic factors, gen includes race, in includes chronic inflammation, which leads to oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, impaired kidney repair ability, also age and the effect of angiotensin II and atherosclerotic vascular damage or uh, influencing the kidney's inability to operate as it did when the individual was younger. And uh, now putting most of the recently known um, mechanisms leading to um, kidney senescence uh, or kidney functional decline, these are various um, uh, mechanisms that lead to this uh, 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 end stage that we see here. So I, would, I, uh, I recommend that you take time and look at, look at this article and, and get a lot of physiology and biochemistry of kidney function out of this uh, review. Now, so now we talk about biomarkers. Um, so the definition of biomarkers, characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathologic, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to a therapy. So a, a good biomarker should uh, fit this definition. Okay, so what are some of the characteristics of ideal biomarker? Non-invasive, easily measured, inexpensive, and provides rapid results from easily available sources. In other words, we should be able to get it from urine or blood and should have high sensitivity, should also be highly specific. It allows early detection of disease and changes in response to treatment and predicts prognosis and allows stratification into categories of risk. It should be biologically plausible, in other words, provides information about the mechanisms of disease. So conventional biomarkers of kidney function that we, can, we now have clinically available are detecting chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. There are two areas that we are obviously look at, measure of kidney function, glomerular filtration rate using blood urea nitrogen, but which we all know over the years that this is extremely un unreliable. Serum creatinine, we put a lot of work uh, things in it, but uh, again, it has its own problems. And cystatin C is now coming up on the stage. Now, markers of kidney damage, we usually look at uh, albuminuria and also urine sediment abnormalities. 
So why is it so important to um, look at kidney function in the aging population? Well, a decrease in GFR increases the risk of accumulation of medications that depend on renal excretion. And as you know, as people age um, and diseases appear, they tend to take a lot of medications. And many of these medications need to be um, removed by the kidneys. So if the GFR decreases, then you have a pretty good uh, possibility that these patients may get toxic from the medications. Now the formulas, as we know, have been clinically available that can both, but they can both underestimate or overestimate the GFR, as we'll see in, in a few minutes. It is unknown to what extent these formula can also be used reliably in the geriatric population, um, because as we will see in a minute, most of these uh, formula were derived from studies that did not include a lot of old people. And yet, we are, we, not, we are now forced to actually estimate their kidney function using these formula. That's one of the problems with them. Okay, so looking at creatinine, which has been uh, uh, around for a long time, and we haven't really found anything suitable to replace it yet, uh, this is what we've known of creatinine over the years. Sorry. Um, it's not going back. Okay, sorry. Okay, so it's readily filtered in the glomerulus. It's, it is not metabolized by the kidney. And proximal tubular secretion of creatinine accounts for about 20%, 10 to 20% of its excretion, leading to overestimate uh, overestimation of the true GFR. Gut bacteria also degrade creatinine and contribute to its clearance. Uh, creatinine can be reabsorbed after glomerular filtration in patients with very low urine and tubular flow rates. And it is produced at a relatively constant rate, which in turn is proportional to the muscle mass of the individual. There is significant between person variability in creatinine generation rate especially as it relates to age, gender, muscle mass, race, and so on. And certain medications such as cimetidine and trimethoprim can increase some creatinine concentration by inhibiting tubular secretion. To account for the variability of serum creatinine, a number of creatinine-based equations have been developed to estimate the uh, uh, GFR. The first one that we, ever, we had was cochrop valve and um, it, it, this equation was derived investigated by 249 patients, 300, 239 men and 10 women, all Caucasian, age 18 to 92, 24% older than 70 years of age. And uh, this, is, this is their uh, patient population that they used to um, derive the first um, um, formula for estimation of GFR. So we had uh, um, for the age range, age ranges 18 to 29, mean age of uh, 24.6. There were 22 patients in that um, category with a mean serum creatinine of 0.99 and a mean creatinine clearance of uh, 115 milliliters per minute. Now, so if we fast forward 60 years of age, the 53 in the 60 to 69 year range, 42 in the 79, 70 to 79 year range, and uh, uh, 17 in the 80 to 90. So this, this has a reasonably large number of um, older individuals in, in, their, in their patient population. And they came up with the formula and for men, um, this formula over here. And this actually formula has been around a long time. It's, it's um, still used in many parts of the world. Um, it's, it's been slowly replaced, at least in the US and some of the Western, other Western countries by the more recent uh, derivations that we'll go over in a minute. So the modification of diet and renal disease study equation 
uh, was derived in 1,628 individuals, including training samples of 1,070 and validation samples of 558. It's, this study was done primarily in individuals who are 18 to, who are 18 to 60, uh, 65 years old. So there weren't very many uh, older individuals in this uh, patient population, and so, but they used uh, the, um, the data to come up with uh, this formula here for estimating the GFR, which I'm sure many of you are currently familiar with. The EGFR using the MDRD equation is less accurate at uh, the estimated GFR of, of greater than um, um, 60 milliliters per minute. Also, it's been shown since the, since the derivation that it's less accurate in the Asian population. This population included, this uh, MDRD population incre uh, included mostly Caucasians and African Americans. Uh, there were some few Hispanics in, in this patient population, but not very, very many. So if I, I caution you using it here in Mexico, you might want to actually uh, see if you can derive your own. Now, the CKD epi, uh, CKD epidemiology collaboration, the researchers pulled data from studies with N of uh, 5,000 to develop and validate the new equation to estimate the GFR. The composition of the data set, we have 57% were male, 32% black, uh, white or other, 63%, 5% Hispanic and 1% Asian. And um, the, the, the study population was 87% of them were um, individuals who were less than 65 years old. So again, uh, only about 20, uh, only about, excuse me, 13% of the patient population actually included individuals over 65 years or older. But this is one of the best formulas we have right now, at least in the United States, that we are working with. So when you, so when you approach using this formula in the older individuals, you should keep that in mind, that this was not, this formula was not derived um, from patients who have a large number of older individuals. And that's the, uh, the expresses a single equation. This is the uh, CKD epi equation. And these are all computerized now. You can get on the internet and plug in your patient's profile and serum creatinine, and it'll give you the, um, the uh, um, GFR, estimated GFR. So the limitations of CKD epi, it should be um, understood that not a single equation is likely to work equally well in all populations. And studies of different populations were pulled to develop and validate the equation. And a sample is not representative of the general population because few participants had high GFR. And relatively few participants were older than 70 years of age or from racial minorities other than black. Incomplete data on diabetes type, immunosuppressive agents for transplantation, measures of muscle mass and other clinical conditions and medications that might affect serum creatinine independent of GFR was not available. The equation does not overcome the limitations of serum creatinine as an endogenous filtration marker. However, CKD epi equation is more accurate than MDRD at higher GFR levels. The cystatin C is now uh, uh, emerging a biomarker that people are looking at for uh, use um, in estimating the GFR or kidney function. Um, it is a, a 13 kilodalton cysteine protease, protease inhibitor and expressed by all nucleated cells and has multiple biological functions, including controlling extracellular proteolysis and modulation of the immune system. Its utility in estimating kidney function derives from the fact that after being freely filtered in the glomerulus, it is then absorbed in the kidney tubules where it is fully degraded. So it does not get reabsorbed 
it does not go back into circulation. The kidneys are responsible for totally destroying the cystatin C that filtered through the glomerulus. There is no active tumor secretion or significant extrarenal elimination. Its concentration is independent of muscle mass, nutritional status, or gender. It is interesting to note that it is distributed in the extracellular space, whereas creatinine is distributed in total body water. As a result, it has a volume of distribution approximately one-third that of creatinine, meaning that it reaches a steady state concentration three times faster. The half-life is 1.5 versus four hours for creatinine. A major advantage of cystatin C over creatinine level is that it is not as influenced by changes in muscle mass. Therefore, estimating equations for EGFR are more accurate across a wide range of body types. Creatinine is secreted by the tubules, whereas cystatin C usually is reabsorbed and degraded in the proximal tubule. Therefore, the findings of cystatin C in the urine suggest that the proximal tubule is damaged. So we have several formulae that have been um, derived experimentally, uh, but none of it is clearly available right now to use. So the conclusion from this is GFR estimating equations using cystatin C level have the promise to provide more accurate estimates of GFR than equations using serum creatinine level, but clinically it's not available at the present time. So now we turn to um, look, looking at how to measure GFR in over older individuals. Many investigators actually have wrestled with this issue and several studies have been done, but I only for time's sake, to conserve time, I only pulled up two very recent studies uh, to share here with, for this discussion. And the first one is uh, nuclear medicine communications uh, pub uh, published in February of 2014, and the purpose of the study was to evaluate renal function in the elderly that they defined individuals over 70 years old, and they're using radio-labeled technician DTPA and creatinine-based formula to compare the results in individuals um, under 70 and over 70. Okay, so here, here are the characteristics of the patients um, the under 70 compared with over se uh, 70. The 26 under 70, uh, 11 were female, and um, the total, total number of 37, mean age of 48, and there are no blacks in this um, group. Uh, body weight, um, 72, a BMI by 25 by the same in the both groups, and creatinine 1.38 1, in the under 70 year age group, 1.43, and di no diabetes in the younger group. Uh, 17 of uh, the older individuals had diabetes. Uh, hypertension is more in the older individuals and the pre-diagnosis of chronic kidney disease was about the same, 13 here and 14 here. So the total number 39 over 70, 37 um, under 70. Okay, so looking at the, um, look, looking at the radio labeled, uh, which is the gold standard, uh, using technetium DTPA, the GFR, uh, in those individuals younger than 70 years old was 80.7. When they used Cockroft Gault in that same group, the GFR was estimated at 85. And when the, that's a real weight, when they used the normalized ideal body weight, the GFR was 76.6. Looking, looking, using MDRD formula, it was 70. Eight, and CKD epi was also about 78. Now for individuals age 70 years and older, 
the DTPA um, radio label GFR was um, 46. Using Cockroft Gold, I, the real weight was about 46. The normalized weight was 40.1. MDRD was 51. And the CKB Epi was also about 51. So in, at least in this patient population, both younger and um, uh, older individuals, the CKD epi and MDRD equations were did pretty much the same, uh, but different from the ideal, uh, the normal uh, radio label GFR. Because the second one uh, study was from the Netherlands, um, two hospitals in the Netherlands. And they also looked at patients aged 70 years or above with an estimated EGFR below 60. The Cockroft Gold and Cockroft Gold calculated with the ideal body weight and MDRD and CKD epi formula were uh, compared with uh, sinistrin, which is um, an exogenous material injected. It's almost like inulin um, and used for the clearance determination. Um, it's interesting, these two studies, that they are looking at individuals that are, they're redefining age, aged population as beginning at 70, 70. But as you heard from Dr. Tonelli this morning, the WHO uh, the definition really is 60 years old. But these other, all these later studies that are being done now, are, not they, they are defining the old individuals as beginning age 70. So if you're 60, between 60 and 70, you are not compared in some of these later studies that are being done right now. So for this Norwegian uh, Netherlands study, the, um, um, there were only 16 patients in this, this, from these two hospitals. And the age, um, mean age is 82, the range is 71 to 87 and the 50% were male, and 19% um, were hospitalized. There's 100% Caucasians, and the BMI is about around 26, and serum creatinine was um, 128 millimoles per liter, and the range is 80 to 292. The, the mean number of medications that these patients are taking is, as you see here, nine. And the range is from three medications to 15 medications in some cases. And the number of comorbidities on the, the mean is five, two to eight. And patients with hypertension, 63% of them had hypertension and 25% had diabetes. So this is what the clearance was, looking, you, using the, um, um, the, uh, the gold standard. The, the patient number one had uh, a 30, GFR was measured at 30, but when you used Cockroft Gold, it was 56, and Cockroft Gold with ideal body weight was 41, so a little closer than Cockroft Gold. The MDRD is way out, twice as much and CKD epi was 57 in this patient. And the second patient, 26, uh, Cockroft Gold, 38, uh, with ideal body weight, 32, uh, MDRD, um, 36, and CKD epi, 32. So going all the way down, so we won't go for um, saving time, I don't think I want to go through all of this. So just summarize this study. The results of the present study indicate that the Cockroft Gold, MDRD, and CKD epi formulae estimate the mean GFR rather well in the, the overall in the population. However, in individual cases, all formulae may misestimate the GFR, as we saw in one case with MDRD, by as much as 31 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared, which is 103% higher than what it should have been. The formula predicts kidney disease stage correctly in only about 50% of the patients. 
And the Cockroft Golf formula calculated with the ideal body weight performed better than the Cockroft Golf calculated with the body weight of the patient and the MDRD and CKDFP formula. So in um, conclusion, estimating renal function in older population, the serum creatinine, the traditional biomarker of kidney function, has significant limitations. Therefore, a formula for estimation of the glomerular filtration rate have been developed to overcome some of these limitations. The MDRD study and CKD epi equations are currently the preferred equations. The uh, CKD epi equation seems to have a slight advantage over the MDRD equation, especially at GFRs greater than 60. Serum cystatin C, a relatively new biomarker, has several advantages over serum creatinine as a biomarker for kidney function and kidney disease, but it is not yet available for general clinical use. The use of these biomarkers and the derived formula have limitations in estimating renal function in the older population, because primarily because the, the formulae were not derived with a large number of older individuals in the uh, patient sample. Thank you very much. Si hay preguntas de parte del auditorio, por favor, es tiempo. En primer lugar, muchas gracias por su interesante conferencia, muy motivadora. Um, quisiera preguntarle explicara el estándar que usaron en esa comparación de las diferentes fórmulas eh, cómo se medía el estándar del clearance de creatinina eh, cuando comparaban con eh, el Cockroft y el MDR de 4 The MDRD the MDRD uh, patients were compared with inulin clearance uh, all, of, all of these patients who had creatinine done during the, uh, um, the, either the uh, recruitment stage or later on in the MDRD study had inulin clearance done. For Cockroft well, they used radioisotope to measure the renal function. problemas uh, que tenemos en medir la función renal en los ancianos, viejos, viejos, esto es los mayores de 80 años, no solo es la disminución en la masa magra corporal, que eso también se define en menor agua corporal total, sino que además de esto sabemos que en los otros compartimentos en general el agua corporal total en los viejos viejos está más reducida. ¿Esto influye realmente aparte del, del músculo, de la pérdida de músculo en, la, en, la, en el cálculo de la filtración glomerular? No, well, actually, if you, you use the formula for the estimation of the GFR, um, part of the, um, in, part of the um, inaccuracy that you, you see is not really related to the GFR, I mean, the, the muscle loss, because the muscle loss um, resulted in the diminishing of the serum creatinine. It is, it, the problem of the formula is that they were not, the, uh, these individuals with, who are significantly muscle wasted and old were not included in the derivation of this formula. They're, 
So the body water composition in the, um, in the derivation of these uh, formula are totally different from the body water of some of these um, older individuals. So that's part of the reason why it's, it's relatively inaccurate to use these formula in the, the older individuals. Not necessarily, it's not really the creatinine as such, it's total body water. Me llama la atención el número tan escaso de estudios que validen la utilidad de la estimación de la tasa de filtración glomerular a partir de la creatinina acérica. Sobre todo, bueno, la experiencia que nosotros tenemos aquí, este, especialmente en el estado de Jalisco, es que la mayoría de los pacientes con estadios tempranos de la enfermedad o estadios intermedios 1 a 3, este, su promedio de edad precisamente es más de 60 años. Siempre nosotros tenemos una preocupación si estamos sobreestimando esa tasa de filtración glomerular, perdón, sobreestimando la presencia de enfermedad renal crónica. Y por otra parte también nos preocupa la falta de estandarización del método, que qué tanto pueda influir en esta sobreestimación del de problema de la enfermedad renal crónica. Well, if, if you're going to use the MDRD formula, the, the serum creatinine actually needs to be standardized, needs to be done in a, a standardized uh, a way, and actually you can see this on the National Kidney Foundation's website about how to standardize the creatinine. Just taking the creatinine from the, your lab may not really be accurate enough to, to know the true GFR of, uh, of your patients. And also it should be, uh, and noted that some of these um, formula were derived with samples that were just collected once or twice and not repeated samples. So that may also add to some of the inaccuracies in some, particularly some of these uh, older individuals if you want to follow them over, uh, over time. But I think using the formula, it gives you a pretty good uh, estimation of where the patients are. It may not be exactly as accurate as the gold standard, but at least it gives you a, a ballpark figure, for especially if you're going to be following these patients on a chronic basis over time. You could see the change in the GFR if you're using the same formula over a period of time. Gracias. En la práctica médica, en la realidad, Generalmente nos reportan en las instituciones la depuración de creatinina. Muchos de nosotros o algunos de nosotros, aparte calculamos COCRO, MDRD y ocasionalmente EPI, la que estaban presentando. Si le damos seguimiento a esos pacientes, vemos que muchas veces eh, van, no varían mucho su, su resultado. Sin embargo, hay pacientes en los que las, los resultados son totalmente tan, tan diferentes que dependiendo del médico que esté valorando al paciente en la toma de decisiones para, para el paciente. Con, un, con esos resultados, con la cifra más baja, un médico puede decidir ingresarlo a diálisis en un paciente mayor de 75 años, mientras otro le da un seguimiento analizando los asuados y prefiere llevar un tratamiento conservador. Usted en la práctica clínica, ante esta diversidad de resultados de las fórmulas, ¿cuál es su actuar, doctor? Ya cuando estamos con el paciente. I think what clinically what I would do is see what kind of symptoms the patient has and not just look at the, um, the, uh, the figure or the number from the uh, estimated GFR. If I have a patient who has an estimated GFR of 16 and who is perfectly fine, is not uh, nause nauseated, it's, uh, uh, appetite is good, body weight uh, is stable, and it's not very anemic or the anemia is controlled with erythropoietin and on the, on the whole 
is doing reasonably well, there's no point in reaching out for the dialysis machine. But if I have a patient who, is, who has a GFR of 18, feels horrible, is, is miserable, then that offering that person dialysis might be a way to go. So when you get to that stage five level, I think you, take, you should exercise your clinical judgment about how the patient is doing and not just look at the numbers. That's, that's the way that I was taught. That's the way I teach medical students. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to cover the topic of uh, basically discuss what we know about the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in older adults in the Western world. Sort of talk about what the relevance of a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease is for these patients. Um, talk about the interaction between age, um, multimorbidity, and chronic kidney disease, and then talk about um, management, what we know about uh, specific management of older adults who develop chronic kidney disease. So, uh, you know, I think Dr. Tonelli probably re reviewed, um, you know, the epidemic of aging that we're all we're experiencing in the Western world. Uh, certainly, the number of people aged greater 65 or greater has in increased dramatically over the last century, and we expect that it will continue to uh, increase at a, and at a an alarming rate. So there's been a tenfold increase in the number of people greater than age 65 in the Western world. Uh, and that, and the, the number of people in this age group has doubled. Uh, the doubling time uh, continues to uh, shorten uh, every decade. The most rapid rate of growth uh, in this population of older adults is in patients greater than 85 years of age. And in fact, um, there's been a tripling in the number of these uh, this, this uh, proportion of the population uh, over the last 30 years. So going forward, we don't expect uh, that that is going to change very much. So uh, uh, this is uh, data from a paper that was uh, published in 2010, and this looks at the projected number of people greater than age 65 uh, over the next 50 years. And you can see that there is actually going to be uh, a dramatic uh, change in our patient population and the population as a whole within the next decade. So uh, the bars on the left side are sort of the numbers from 2010, and the bars on the uh, extreme right of each, within each age group, are what we expect those populations to look like in 2050. And you can see within 10 years, our patient practices are gonna change dramatically. The thing is, in the Western world, uh, our populations are already old. So uh, this is a uh, sort of a, uh, a depiction of the prevalence of, or the proportion of patients greater than age 65 in the OECD countries, which are predominantly Western Europe and Canada. And you can see my country just kind of falls in the middle of the pack here. So this is the average, which is about 15%. So 15% of the population in these countries is greater than age 65. When you look at Germany, Italy, Greece, that number is already at 18 to 20%. So if you think about the projections uh, that we were, I was uh, showing you in the previous slide, um, the, uh, you know, diseases of the aged uh, are going to be increasingly important uh, over the next decades, the coming decades. So what do we know about chronic kidney disease? Well, we certainly know that it is a disease of the elderly. And we know this from a number of population-based uh, uh, population studies. Uh, this is a study uh, of uh, people in Southeast England, where chronic kidney disease was defined as a serum creatinine greater than 135 for women and 180 for men. And what you can see is that for the population on average, um, chronic kidney disease was reported to have uh, a prevalence rate in the range of 5,000 per million. But as soon as you go greater, you know, as soon as you look at these older age groups, you can see a dramatic increase uh, in the number of cases per million in the, in the range of 70,000 per million. So, um, you know, greater than a tenfold increase once you get into, uh, um, you know, the age groups greater than 70. This has been shown in a number of different population-based studies. So this is data from NHANES, which is a large prospective observational study in the United States. And so when, uh, when this, when, so two time areas were looked at. This is a, very, a, a large ongoing study. And when you look at the time era between 1968 and 1994, and, and between 1999 and 2004, you can see that there has been an increase in the rate of CKD, right, in the prevalence of CKD within each age group. Uh, and you can see that the overall prevalence is 
enormously high. So if you look at the most recent data, almost 50% of patients greater than age, or people greater than age 70 had CKD by some definition. So, uh, you know, almost 40% of people in this cohort had stage three CKD or greater. So uh, those are pretty alarming numbers. Similar data, by the way, has been, uh, similar types of results have been shown in other cohorts. Um, you know, what's even more interesting is when you look at um, um, people in long-term care facilities, so uh, people age greater than 65 uh, in nursing homes, for example, the rate of CKD can be as high as 80%. So uh, this is actually data from Alberta, my home province, uh, and um, essentially it mirrors the data that I've already shown you, which is, um, again, so uh, again, depicting um, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease uh, as a function of age. And you can see, as soon as you uh, go to age greater than 65, the prevalence uh, increases to about 20%, uh, to as high as almost 50% uh, in, in people greater than 85 years of age. So a huge problem. You know, one of the uh, issues that has come up uh, when we look at these prevalence studies is, you know, are we, um, are we, are, are we giving somebody a false diagnosis of chronic kidney disease? Uh, you know, there are issues with, you know, certainly as physicians, we are certainly more aware of what chronic kidney disease is, and we are labeling more patients with chronic kidney disease. And these new GFR estimation equations, which were reviewed in the last uh, talk, um, certainly have identified a whole group of people that we didn't previously um, identify as having chronic kidney disease. That being said, regardless of what type of estimation equation you use, whether it's cystatin-based or simcreatinine-based, what you see is a, a, a high prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the older population. So um, we can, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the relevance of, the, of this finding in a moment. As I showed you in the previous slides looking at the NHANES data, the, the prevalence of CKD in the elderly is also increasing. So when you look at the two different time eras between 88 and 94 and 2005 and 2010, you can see that there has been, you know, uh, not only is our population of elderly people increasing, but the proportion of those people with chronic kidney disease is also increasing. And this is American data, for, this is um, Medicare data, so this is where CKD was diagnosed using administrative claims data. And again, you can make the uh, argument that perhaps we're just identifying chronic kidney disease uh, more readily than we used to. Um, but, you know, again, the data also uh, shows similar trends and, and that the prevalence of particularly CKD stage three or greater uh, has increased over time. So again, we have time here on the horizontal uh, axis. And what you can see is that in every, um, in every ethnic type um, in, in the U.S. Pop Medicare population, so these are patients greater than age 65 covered by Medicare, um, there has been a, a significant increase in chronic kidney disease, and it's been primarily in stage three, so this kind of uh, brownish bar, um, and, and, and greater. So, this is an interesting study that was published in 2013, and what this shows is essentially what's ahead. What are we, you know, and the authors in this study tried to project the lifetime risk of any individual born in, in 2012 for developing chronic kidney disease. And what they reported was, a, you know, an enormously high risk in the range of 60%. So for any person born in 2012, their lifetime risk of developing chronic kidney disease, was in, they, they estimated to be in the range of 60%. And this was based on data showing sort of the current picture. And so what you see in the red here, so what you have here is the population um, by age and the age group here, and the, and the known chronic kidney disease, people who will develop chronic kidney disease, and, and, and people who they anticipate will develop chronic kidney disease. As you can see, it's mostly skewed to the higher age group, so most of the chronic kidney disease that we currently see is in people greater than age 65. The dark gray bars show the number of, of patients within each age group whom they expect to develop chronic kidney disease, and you can see that number is much larger. So what we're looking at right now is just the tip of the iceberg. So how does age interact with chronic kidney disease, or, or, or um, uh, what is the relationship between age and chronic kidney disease? It's a, it's a complicated one. Uh, we certainly know that there are structural and functional changes uh, in the kidney that occur with age. Um, 
and I will briefly review those, but I won't discuss them in a great deal of detail. But we also know that age also, as we all age, we accumulate other risk factors for chronic kidney disease, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obviously all of those things. As you get older, your likelihood of developing any of those things uh, increases. So, you know, to what extent the chronic kidney disease we see is a function of age alone uh, is difficult, is, is difficult to know. Uh, that being said, we know the most common cause of chronic kidney disease in uh, at older adults is diabetic nephropathy. So, it, you know, it's been observed in a number of studies that GFR declines with age. Uh, but what you can see is that there's a great deal of variability uh, in terms of uh, that GFR decline. So there was the Baltimore Aging Study, uh, which uh, suggested that the rate of decline was uh, you know, in the range of one mil per minute per year. But you can see basically after the age of 20, there is a general trend towards a decrease uh, in GFR. Um, although we know that GFR is, old, uh, is lower in older adults, the extent to which this phenomenon reflects normal aging versus true chronic kidney disease is unclear, because we don't really know much about uh, how the structural and functional changes associated with aging actually um, affect kidney function per se. What we do know is that as we get older, um, your, the kidney weight decreases, there's a decrease in renal mass, uh, there's an increase in glomerulosclerosis, we get decreased renal blood flow, um, and there are also vascular changes. You get intimal hypertrophy, um, you get uh, dropout of peritubular capillaries, um, increased vascular resistance. Uh, these things are, are, have been observed in a number of uh, studies, particularly of uh, older donors, kidney donors. Uh, but the extent to which they cause chronic kidney disease um, or, uh, is not entirely clear. We certainly know that people aged at, you know, greater than 65 accumulate, as I mentioned earlier, a number of comorbidities. So this is, again, Medicare data um, on the left-hand side. Looking, so this is all, these, these uh, reflect all patients greater than age 65 covered by Medicare in the U.S and versus patients in a younger demographic. So this is a private uh, health insurance uh, group and where the mean age in, in that particular group is between 50 and 64. And what you see is, you know, when you look at the difference between the two groups, you can see the patients greater than, or the people greater than age 65 have a much higher prevalence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, uh, and not surprisingly, chronic kidney disease. Um, because as we get older, all of these conditions develop. So multimorbidity is an important factor to consider. And perhaps it's just the accumulation of all these other risks for chronic kidney disease um, that results in, in this decline in GFR as we age, the observed decline. Um, and just in a, this is just an illustration of uh, what, what older patients look like. So this is a, a cohort of patients in Alberta. Uh, and this work was done by Brenda, Brenda Hemmelgard in Calgary. And she looked at um, all, this is a population-based study of all people greater than age 65 who had certain creatinines drawn in the province. Um, and then she, did, she sort of divided them by age group group. But what you can say, um, in addition to the fact that their GFRs would be what we call borderline stage three, uh, is that obviously there, you know, a lot of, there's a fairly high prevalence of diabetes, that as we, as, you know, the age of the population increases, the comorbidity score also increases. Again, reflecting the fact that as we get older, we accumulate more problems. And, and you know, you can see the high proportion of patients that are on multiple medications uh, that may also potentially affect GFR and GFR measurements. So it's important to note all these things when you're looking at population-based population studies uh, of CKD. So, you know, so we've certainly identified a, large, a fairly significant proportion of people in the older age group. Um, that have CKD as based on, you know, GFR estimation equations. But really, what is the significance of that CKD diagnosis? Do these CKD patients in older adults, or these low GFR patients, do they behave this similarly to younger patients with chronic kidney disease? What can we say about the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease um, in older adults? And can we apply the results of randomized trials uh, of treatment for CKD to people in this population? Well, you know, the prevalence, we know that the prevalence of CKD is high, and we certainly have been uh, taught over the years that we need to use uh, strategies to slow progression of uh, CKD. But we don't really know much about um, the rate of progression of CKD. So, you know, if you look at randomized controlled trial data, patients with CKD can lose up to seven to eight mils per minute of GFR. Um, yet, when you look at uh, the Baltimore Aging Study, the natural loss of GFR is really in the rate 
uh, you know, is in the, only in the range of 0.75 to 1 mil per minute per year. So uh, again, um, Brenda Hemmergarten Calgary looked at uh, this cohort of older patients uh, in Alberta. And what she found was that, in fact, the rate of change of GFR, the GFR, uh, oops, uh, the, the, the rate of uh, CKD progression is actually quite low uh, in older adults. So if you can see that in the, uh, you know, in the cohort that uh, she looked at uh, over the course of uh, a couple of years, that the rate in non-diabetics was in the range of one mil per minute per year, and the rate of diabetics was two mils per minute per year. So in fact, the focus of care for these patients shouldn't necessarily be on um, mitigating a uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. It should really be on cardiovascular risk reduction. So as has been shown in a number of studies, uh, low GFR is associated with an increased risk of death. So in this particular elderly cohort that was studied in Alberta, you can see that the risk of death uh, was directly linked to GFR with the, highest, uh, the lowest GFR group having approximately a 40% mortality over the observed time period as compared to patients uh, with uh, better kidney function. And again, this has been shown in numerous studies. This isn't uh, specific to the elderly patient population. But age does uh, modify the relationship between GFR and mortality. So you can see the, highest, uh, the strongest association between mortality and uh, low GFR is actually in younger patient populations. So the uh, attributable risk of chronic kidney disease uh, is highest in patients that are uh, or people less than 65 years of age. The absolute mortality is certainly higher in the older age groups, but that is not unexpected. Um, the attributable risk from chronic kidney disease is significantly lower. You can see um, there's, a, there, there's a substantial difference between um, uh, older and younger uh, people with respect to the clinical importance of chronic kidney disease in this population. So in fact, when you look at, we know that it, you know, in general, uh, people with chronic kidney disease, particularly stage uh, three and uh, four, are more likely to die than to progress to end-stage renal disease. So uh, again, this is uh, looking at um, a, uh, a, the, the, uh, a number of privately insur patients in a private uh, insurance health plan in the United States, in, Kaiser, in the Kaiser Health Plan in California. And what they looked at was they looked at you know, what happened to patients with a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease over time. And you can see, in fact, that the end-stage renal disease is depicted in the yellow, and you can see a relatively small proportion of people progress to end-stage renal disease. The biggest risk for these patients is, in fact, death. It's not progression to dialysis. And age does, uh, there is a, there, it does modify the relationship between the risk of end-stage renal disease um, and the risk of death. So as you can see, in people uh, less than uh, age 45, the incidence of end-stage renal disease is much higher than the, um, than the risk of death. Uh, but once you hit 65 and older, you can see that really it's only when you reach a GFR of 15 or less where your risk of end-stage renal disease is higher than your risk of death. That being said, um, just as a numbers game, we have seen a, 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 a large increase in the uh, growth of, our, of older people on dialysis. Um, so you can see this is a, just depicting the incidence of uh, end-stage renal disease in older adults uh, between 1980 and 2007. And you can see there has been a, both an, inc an increase in the incidence of end-stage renal disease and a dramatic in, uh, increase in the prevalence of older people in our end-stage renal disease population. And this is largely due to better care. We're giving them, you know, these people are living longer. Uh, and so uh, our dialysis cohort does get older. And, and even though, you know, for any individual person, their risk of death is higher than the risk of end-stage renal disease if they've got CKD, uh, we are certainly seeing uh, a dramatic growth in, our, uh, 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 in the older uh, ESRD population. And this is a, you know, the, these trends have been shown in a number of different um, population-based studies. So this is Canadian data. And again, showing essentially the proportion, the age, this is just uh, incident end-stage renal disease patients stratified by age with the top two lines uh, reflecting the older age groups, grade age 65 and older. And you can see most of the growth uh, in end-stage renal disease population in Canada has been in the, these older age groups. Uh, and you've seen that over the last, uh, really, over the last uh, decade and a half or so. 
We also know that the survival uh, for these patients has uh, improved as well. So, um, you know, so this is a study that was done by Vanita Jassel from the University of Toronto. Uh, and she looked at dialysis, um, you know, how, how patients who were on dialysis did over two eras. The first era was 1990 to 1994, uh, and the second era uh, was 1995 to 1990 uh, to 1999. And what she showed that uh, whether, you, you know, in people greater than age 65, survival is certainly improved. So, you know, whereas dialysis, you know, we were associate dialysis with very poor uh, short-term survival and long-term survival in this patient population 15 years ago, that has changed. And in fact, estimates for uh, survival now are quite different. So you can see that, you know, uh, in 1990, if you were a 75-year-old person starting dialysis, uh, your life expectancy was about two and a half years, and we can see there's been a significant increase in life expectancy in all of these older age groups over time. And that will likely imp uh, improve with improving care or increase. So that being said, um, how do we manage this huge uh, group of people with chronic kidney disease? Um, is there anything that, um, is there any, you know, there's certainly not enough nephrologists to manage this large population of uh, people uh, with this diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. So, uh, you know, one, one way that we have uh, addressed this issue, certainly in Alberta, has been the use of multidisciplinary care cl clinics. And again, this is work that was done by uh, Brenda Hemelgarn, one of our, my colleagues in Calgary. And uh, what she did was study um, older adults who were referred to our, our multidisciplinary or pre-dialysis or CKD clinics. And she, want, she basically wanted to compare older adults who were referred versus older adults that were not referred to a multidisciplinary clinic uh, for care of uh, chronic kidney disease. And what she showed was in the unreferred population, and so we, this was all um, uh, done using our, uh, our, uh, our administrative databases, but what you can see is that um, the, pa the populations look quite different. So um, in terms of who gets referred, uh, with, with regards to the, what the, the proportion of patients who have diabetes, the proportion that are male. Um, certainly the referred patients were more likely to be on an ACE inhibitor, uh, were more likely to be on a statin, and less likely to be on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So she used a propensity score analysis approach uh, to see whether there were any um, benefits uh, with regards to end -stage, development of end-stage renal disease or risk of death in patients who were referred uh, to a multidisciplinary care team or not. Uh, and so, um, uh, just to sort of uh, briefly describe what this means, uh, a propensity score is essentially a, a way to adjust for the fact that um, the, the probab the, that patients who are referred to a multidisciplinary care clinic are, are probably slightly different than people that are not. And so it's a statistical method uh, to sort of try and remove differences between those two populations. And what she found, in fact, that there was a significant reduction in mortality uh, in these older adults who were referred to the multidisciplinary care clinic, despite the fact that they had um, a higher rate of diabetes, uh, that they tended to be male. So they had other risk factors um, for death um, that you would think might uh, bias uh, the result in favor of the non-referred group, but in fact, what she found was that there was a substantial uh, mortality uh, improvement in patients uh, who were referred to these types of multidisciplinary care clinics. And just to sort of uh, describe what what these clinics look like, these are primarily uh, nurse-driven clinics. So we have nurses, dietitians, social workers um, who work with these patients who are, and, and we use sort of a case management approach. So they're primarily managed by these nurses with input from the physicians when necessary. So it's a very efficient way to deal with a lot of uh, people. And, and most of the care that is provided is protocol driven. So protocols for hypertension, protocols for dyslipidemia, for anemia management, uh, and all those sorts of things. So this might be a way to approach this, um, you know, this, this group of patients who can't possibly all be seen by a nephrologist. Uh, we, know, we certainly know that there is a certain degree of bias in terms of who gets referred to a nephrologist as well. So the other, and this is uh, data from the UK, and what they actually found was your likelihood of being referred to a, a kidney specialist was actually uh, lower uh, as you were older. So there's certainly a bias on the part of primary care physicians to not refer these people. Uh, so, you know, this is something that we, will, we do all need to address uh, as a community. 
um, to both increase the uh, sort of uh, awareness of chronic kidney disease and, and think about how to best manage these people. So in summary, we know that chronic kidney disease is common in the elderly, you know, affecting upwards of 50% of people in this age group. That the rate of kidney function uh, loss is fairly minimal, actually. Um, that really, we need to be focusing on cardiovascular risk reduction, which can be done by a number of other specialists besides nephrologists. Um, we can expect that the absolute numbers of older, older people with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease will continue to rise and that multidisciplinary care seems to be associated with survival, so this may be one approach that we can tackle this uh, growing problem. And that, you know, certainly system-wide changes in healthcare delivery will be needed to address the needs of these patients. There are just simply too many people um, who, have, uh, uh, these, uh, who have this disease uh, for, to be managed by one particular specialty group. And that's it, so I'd be happy to take any questions. I just wanted to thank Dr. Garcia for inviting me to speak and Brenda for giving me some of her slides. Bien, eh, agradecemos la participación de la doctora Nispano de Canadá y quien desea participar con alguna pregunta, tenemos tiempo para tres personas que quieran hacer uso del micrófono. Gracias. Um, you, you did translate. The... I don't have a. Yeah, I don't have headphones. Okay. En primer lugar quiero quiero Felicitarla también por su presentación que orienta mucho sobre el... Well, I, I, I intended to speak in English. Okay. So, the first question is uh, congratulations for your conference, very interesting. And my first question is uh, about why women, they have uh, less GFR, if you compare with men, the first question. And the second, what is your advice to improve um, the, the age GFR compared with health elderly people and uh, illness elderly people? Because many times you need to um, take resolution about when start to dialysis, when to start the treatment, but you know, you, 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 di, you need to know how is the, the best um, calculation of GFR for this patient in elder, elderly people. Um, is the nature down with GFR or is only illness? What is your advice in the practice, uh, the tips? I mean, I think all of us are faced with these, um, these patients who have this low GFR syndrome, so these older adults who have GFRs that we would call um, stage 3A, I guess, between 45 and 60. I mean, my, personally, my approach to these patients is really to try and, and use the more recent KDGO guidelines. So look at their risk factors as a whole. Use the heat map. Look at, look at what their, their risk for events is. Do they have proteinuria? Uh, you know, so, Predominantly cardiovascular, you know, look at the lipid, uh, look at their lipid profiles, all of those things, uh, and, and really try and base treatment on those things. I mean, I, I, I don't base treatment on GFR alone. I think you have to look at the entire patient, look at their overall risks for progression. As you can see from, if you look at the population as a whole for patients with chronic kidney disease, um, the risk of progression is quite low. So unless you're a diabetic or you have proteinuric renal disease, um, those patients are certainly at high risk. We know that from uh, lots of population-based studies. We have to extrapolate that that is also true in the older population. So I don't look at age specifically when I'm, um, you know, when I'm thinking about treatment. I really look at their risk profile. So what are their cardiovascular risks? What are their risks for CKD progression based on what we currently know? And then base treatment on that. Now, with regards to your first question about uh, women versus men, that I, I don't have a brilliant answer for that question. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I, I, it's, it's, 
it's a, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not certainly, it's, I'm not, not enough of an expert in, um, in the estimation equations and things like that to, to really explain the, the difference that we see. Bien, una participación. Well, here in Mexico, it's really common that uh, when the elderly patient needs uh, dialysis, uh, the main problem is the economic issue. So, but in Canada, I think it is not, maybe, I'm not sure, but uh, what do you think it's more uh, prevalent in Canada? Ageism or economic factors to recommend uh, dialysis? dialysis in the elder? Well, I mean, uh, certainly the economic factors are different in Mexico than they are in Canada. Um, you know, I think as individual physicians, we don't, you know, as a healthcare system, obviously, we're quite cognizant of the fact that dialysis is an expensive treatment and that um, it's a limited resource. Um, well, we don't necessarily uh, take that into consideration at an individual's bedside. I think when we make that decision about dialysis, it's usually based on the functional status of the patient. Um, obviously, um, I think there'll probably be further um, talks in the next, uh, in the in the in the later in the afternoon and tomorrow about um, the decision conservative management versus uh, the provision of dialysis. Certainly, in people that uh, we consider to be at. Uh, high risk of not doing well on dialysis, so poor functional status to start with. Um, conservative care is certainly uh, is uh, discussed. I mean, it's discussed with every single patient, uh, really regardless of age. So I don't think that economic factors are as much of a driver of those decisions uh, in Canada as they are in the United States. But I think, you know, as a profession, we're certainly aware that this isn't a growing population of our dialysis uh, patients, and that. Um, perhaps we need to uh, expand the discussion about conservative care and what dialysis really provides in terms of uh, life expectancy uh, to these patients, particularly in the very old uh, age groups. Bien, eh, tenemos tiempo para otra pregunta. Eh, gracias, doctora Anís Palo, por su participación. Y eh, el siguiente tiempo es para comer. Tenemos un tiempo.